it's a, it's a sad day for the literary community. Um, we've lost uh, a wonderful, delightful, important writer, uh, Terry Pratchett. And I know Terry Pratchett was a good friend and collaborator of yours, and more than either of those words can really convey. So I was hoping maybe you just might, might want to start out just by telling us about Terry and wh why he was important to you and why he is important to all of us or ought to be. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it was a, it was a horrible morning. Um, I woke up and, uh, and I was cleaning my teeth and Amanda came in and just started hugging me, which she normally doesn't do when I'm cleaning my teeth. <laughs> um, and then she said, do you want to come and sit on the bed? And I said, sure, because I couldn't think of any reason not to come <laughs> and sit on the bed when asked by somebody who had hugged me all the way through a very long tooth cleaning. <laughs> And I sat down, and she said, uh, Terry passed away in the night. And I was so pleased that she was the one of us who had gone onto her phone first mm. and seen the news, and I got to hear it from a human being. Mm. Um, Terry Pratchett, Sir Terry Pratchett. I, I met Terry 30 years and one month ago in a Chinese restaurant in London, and uh, he had just, he had one novel out at that point called The Color of Magic, mm. and had not yet published The Light Fantastic, the sequel, and I was a journalist, and I was asked to go and interview him for a magazine called Space Voyager, <laughs> and uh, who was so, such a small magazine that they, they asked me if I could take a camera and take photographs of Terry, <laughs> which I did. So somewhere I have the world's worst photographs <laughs> of, of Terry. Um, but it, it was that weird thing where you sit down with somebody and you realize that the Venn diagrams of your minds overlap. Mm -hmm. You share headspace. And I, I remember at one point we just wandered onto um, jokes about forbidden books. For, we, we both had heads that had taken us to the point where we decided there should be a forbidden book that was a phone book. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Terry had come up with the uh, Necro Telecomnicom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had come up with the Liber Fulvarum Paginarum, or the Book of Yellow Colored Pages. <laughs> um, and it was like, okay, we, we had the same kind of heads. They it was and sitting there going, oh my gosh, you're one of, you're one of me too. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there was another mm -hmm. one around. So in, in the years that followed, um, we would have the kind of conversations where Terry would say to me things like, uh, so, I'm done with the Discworld, and now I'm going to do this big science fiction series. I've come up with it, and this is the plot of the science fiction series, and you tell me all about it. And you get to the end, and I'd say, well, that's all very well, but I think you should do a book about death. <laughs> and then a week later, my phone would ring, and I'd pick it up, and a voice would say, you bastard, it's <laughs> called Mort. And he'd put the phone <laughs> and, um, and it was in those strange early days before computers could talk to each other. Mm -hmm. When we had computers, but they didn't talk. And so very often my phone would ring and Terry would say, yeah, what's funnier? And he'd, <laughs> he'd throw two things at me. <laughs> and I'd listen to them. I, you know, I'd say, what's funnier? Is it funnier if somebody's brought up by dwarfs and doesn't notice they're ridiculously tall? Or is it funnier if they're a lost prince and they never notice they're the lost prince? And I say, well, you know you could do both. <laughs> Most of our conversations were me saying, you know you could do both. <laughs> and him saying, how? <laughs> so we, we do those kind of things. Um, somewhere in there, I wrote a book called Don't Panic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Companion which was written in that kind of classic English humor style. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the end of it, I thought, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And 
I sat down, I had an idea for something that combined this, this ridiculous English series of children's books called the William Books with the omen, the plot of the <laughs> omen. <laughs> and in my head it was gonna be called William the Antichrist. <laughs> and I wrote the first 5,000 pages. Uh, sorry, let's try that again. I wrote the first, okay. I did not. I They're was very fast, but not small. I wrote pages. the first 5,000 words. Uh -huh. There we go. The first, which would have been the first, I don't know, what's 5,000 words? 30 pages? Like, yeah, Something not like that. quite. Yeah. Um, 25 pages. Mm -hmm. And I sent it off to a few friends. I posted it and said, look, this is this thing that I think I'm doing. And then Sandman happened. So mm -hmm. suddenly, my entire life became writing Sandman. And one day, the phone rings. And a voice at the other end says, Ear, that thing you sent me, you doing anything with that? Mm. And I said, well, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm writing Sandman and books of magic and all of this other stuff. And he said, well, tell you what. Either sell me the idea and that opening, or we can write it together. Mm because I want to find out what happens next. <laughs> and I said, we are going to write it together, because I am not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm going, this is rather like, you know, the, the analogy that I've got it to at this point is just, I've said it's a lot like Michelangelo phoning you up <laughs> and saying, you know, do you want to paint a ceiling together? Mm -hmm. You go, here is somebody who really knows his craft. He is an absolute craftsman. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to write a novel with him is one, this is, this is the equivalent of the ultimate MFA. Mm -hmm. So I said yes. And at that point, I was still writing Sandman and still writing books of magic. So normally about two o'clock in the morning, I would get out of whatever document I was in and go over to Good Omens, and I would write Good Omens until about four or five o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. then I'd go to sleep. I'd wake up about one o'clock in the afternoon, and my uh, answering machine, the little red light would be flashing. Back before we had the kind I of thought you we have now. Yeah. You should mention. You had these machines. <laughs> they would sit there, they actually had tapes. As big as a bus. They were. Yeah. Many of them were yeah. buses. Yeah, yeah. And they had tapes, and you would press a button, and the tape would go all the way back before you could find out. This was so long ago. Mm -hmm. um, before you could find out the message that somebody had for you, which they hadn't even texted you. You, you, you had to listen to it in words. So, Terry, the words would go, get up, get up, you bastard, I've just written a good bit. <laughs> Had you divided the, the sections or wait, wait, um, was there most, email yet? That no, you, what, you what, could there send? was no email. Mm -hmm. um, what we would do was we would talk plot on the phone each day for maybe an hour, hour and a half, make each other laugh, mm -hmm. come up with great gags, talk about what we were going to do next, and then it was a mad dash to get to the next good bit before the other one could. Mm. <laughs> So Terry would, would still be on section A, and I would say, okay, well, I'll, I'll go and do this then. Mm -hmm. And we kind of divided characters, mm. but then as we got toward the end of the book, we started handing bits back mm -hmm. so that by the end we had each written every character. Mm -hmm. You know, to begin with, um, I was doing all the Four Horsemen stuff, for example. So the Four Horsemen are mine until they get to the aerodrome mm -hmm. when I give them to Terry. Mm -hmm. um, the kids were mostly Terry until they set off for the aerodrome, at which point they become mine. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, then we'd go in and start footnoting each other's bits mm -hmm. or just adding gags mm -hmm. to each other's bits. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the section, I want to read a bit of yeah, Good Omens tonight, and I haven't... Um, <laughs> I haven't actually read 
any of Good Omens in front of an audience since probably 1990, when Terry and I wow. were on tour. Mm. Um, that was a long time ago. So, <laughs> 25 years. And what I liked about this section, well, you'll see what I liked about this section. <laughs> um, but I did the first draft on this, Terry did the second, and some of my favorite jokes and lines are his. But also, it's because of where it goes. It was very early on Saturday morning, on the last day of the world, and the sky was redder than blood. The International Express delivery man rounded the corner at a careful 35 miles an hour, shifted down to second and pulled up on the grass verge. He got out of the van and immediately threw himself into a ditch to avoid an oncoming lorry that had barreled around the bend at something well in excess of 80 miles an hour. He got up, picked up his glasses, put them back on, retrieved his parcel and clipboard, brushed the grass and mud from his uniform, and, as an afterthought, shook his fist at the rapidly diminishing lorry. Shouldn't be allowed, bloody lorries. No respect for the other road users. What I always say, what I always say, is remember that without a car, son, you're just a pedestrian too. <laughs> <laughs> he climbed down the grassy verge, clambered over a low fence, and found himself beside the River Uck. The International Express delivery man walked along the banks of the river, holding the parcel. Farther down the riverbank sat a young man dressed all in white, he was the only person in sight. His hair was white, his skin chalk pale, and he sat and stared up and down the river as if he were admiring the view. He looked like how Victorian romantic poets looked just before the consumption and drug abuse really started to cut him. <laughs> <laughs> the International Express man couldn't understand it. I mean, in the old days, and it wasn't that long ago really, there'd been an angler every dozen yards along the bank. Children had played there, courting couples had come to listen to the splish and gurgle of the river and to hold hands and get all lovey-dovey in the Sussex sunset. He'd done that with Maud, his missus, before they were married. They'd come here to spoon, and on one memorable occasion, fork. <laughs> <laughs> Times changed, reflected the delivery man. <laughs> now white and brown sculptures of foam and sludge drifted serenely down the river, often covering it for yards at a stretch. And where the surface of the water was visible, it was covered with a molecules-thin petrochemical sheen. There was a loud whirring as a couple of geese, thankful to be back in England again after the long, exhausting flight across the northern Atlantic, landed on the rainbow-slicked water and sank without trace. <laughs> Funny old world, thought the delivery man. Here's the Uck, used to be the prettiest river in this part of the world, and now it's just a glorified industrial sewer. The swans sink to the bottom, and the fishes float on the top. Well, that's progress for you. You can't stop progress. He'd reached the man in white. Excuse me, sir, party name of Chalky? <laughs> the man in white nodded, said nothing. He continued to gaze out at the river, following an, Im an impressive sludge and foam sculpture with his eyes. So beautiful, he whispered. It's all so damn beautiful. The delivery man found himself temporarily devoid of words. Then his automatic systems cut in. Funny old world, isn't it? And no mistake, I mean, you go all over the world delivering, and then here you are practically in your own home, so to speak. I mean, I was born and bred round here, sir, and I've been to the Mediterranean, to, to Des Moines, and that's in America, sir. Mm. And now here I am, and here's your parcel, sir. Party name of Chalky took the parcel and took the clipboard and signed for the parcel. The pen developed a leak as he did so, and his signature obliterated itself as it was written. There was a long, it was a long word, and it began with a P, and then there was a splodge, and then it ended in something that might have been ENTS, and might have been Ocean. Much obliged, sir, said the delivery man. He walked back along the river, 
back toward the busy road where he left his van, trying not to look at the river as he went. Behind him, the man in white opened the parcel. In it was a crown, a circlet of white metal set with diamonds. He gazed at it for some seconds with satisfaction, then put it on. It glinted in the light of the rising sun. Then the tarnish, which had begun to suffuse its silver surface when his fingers touched it, spread to cover it completely, and the crown went black. White stood up. There's one thing you can say for air pollution. You get utterly amazing sunrises. It looked like someone had set fire to the sky. And a careless match would have set fire to the river. Hmm. But alas, there was no time for that now. <laughs> In his mind, he knew where the four of them would be meeting and when, and he was going to have to hurry to be there by this afternoon. Perhaps we will set fire to the sky, he thought. And he left that place almost imperceptibly. It was nearly time. The delivery man had left his van on the grass verge by the dual carriageway. He walked around to the driver's side carefully because other cars and lorries were still rocketing round the bend, reached in through the open window and took the schedule from the dashboard. Only one more delivery to make then. He read the instructions on the delivery voucher carefully. He read them again, paying particular attention to the address and the message. The address was one word everywhere. Then with, it, with his leaking pen, he wrote a brief note to Maud, his wife. It read simply, I love you. Then he put the schedule back on the dashboard, looked left, looked right, looked left again, and began to walk purposefully across the road. He was halfway across when a German juggernaut came around the corner, its driver crazed on caffeine, little white pills, and EEC transport regulations. <laughs> he watched its receding bulk. Cool, he thought, that one nearly had me. Then he looked down at the gutter. Oh, he thought. Yes, agreed a voice from behind his left shoulder, or at least from behind the memory of his left shoulder. The delivery man turned and looked and saw. At first he couldn't find the words, couldn't find anything, and then the habits of a working lifetime took over, and he said, message for you, sir. For me? Yes, sir. He wished he still had a throat. He could have swallowed if he had a throat. No package, I'm afraid, Mr. Uh, sir. It's a message. Deliver it, then. It's this, sir. <clears throat> Come and see. Finally. There was a grin on its face. But then, given the face, there couldn't have been anything else. Thank you, it continued. I must commend your devotion to duty. Sir? The late delivery man was falling through a gray mist, and all he could see were two spots of blue that might have been eyes and might have been distant stars. Don't think of it as dying, said death. Just think of it as leaving early to avoid the rush. <laughs> <laughs> the delivery man had a brief moment to wonder whether his new companion was making a joke and to decide that he wasn't. And then there was nothing. Hmm. <clears throat> so, in that passage in this book, in many of his books, one you mentioned in particular, and in much of your work as well, in very overt ways sometimes, uh, both Terry and you have written about death um, in its various incarnations. Um, what can you tell us? What do you know about? Uh, he, we, I, I know he was diagnosed some time ago. He had time to prepare and get ready. Do you have any clue as to what his sort of uh, thinking was about his own death? When, as it, Terry, Terry was diagnosed in 2007 mm -hmm. with early onset rear brain Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Rear brain Alzheimer's is not like 
classic Alzheimer's. Classic Alzheimer's is, is the front of your brain, um, and you lose memory, and you lose people, you lose words. Terry had rear brain Alzheimer's, so what he would lose was spatial relationships hmm. and objects. Um, he might not have been able to find that glass. He almost definitely wouldn't have been able to pick it up. Hmm. And, uh, but he knew that eventually it was going to be, um, you know, it would be the same result that anybody gets with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. He did something huge and noble, which was after his diagnosis, he went public and he went loud. Mm -hmm. And given that he risked being trivialized, you know, Terry was somebody who fought for years to try and make people understand that funny and serious are not opposites. Mm -hmm. The opposite of funny is not funny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can absolutely be funny and serious at the same time. And Terry was. Mm -hmm. So here's somebody who has fought to be taken seriously and to make people go realize that you can write a serious novel set in a fantasy context on the back, on a, on a flat world, on the back of elephants, on the back of a giant turtle floating through space, and it can still be a real novel. And he's He's got there. He's now got the, he's won the Carnegie Medal. He's got attention, serious critical attention, and now he risks losing it. Mm -hmm. um, but he did. He announced it to the world, and he used it as an opportunity to start the dialogue, to start talking about the fact that um, in the last 30 years, since Terry and I met, we have made such incredible progress in the battle against cancer. Huge amounts of money have gone into it, huge amounts of research have gone into it, amazing drug treatments, various treatments have happened. Um, your chances of surviving cancer, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot better mm. than they were. Um, compared to What's gone into cancer, it's pennies have gone into Alzheimer's, mm. which is something that you are much more likely to get. Mm. And it's a place you're much more likely to go, unfortunately, than you ever are to get cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so Terry decided to get loud about that and to start talking about that. And then Terry incredibly bravely decided that he wanted the right to die at the time of his own choosing. Mm -hmm. And given that that was illegal in the UK, he decided to try and do what he could to change the law or at least draw attention to it. And he made a fantastic documentary. He wrote brave, angry articles, um, basically saying, you should be allowed to die without your loved ones risking being prosecuted for murder. Mm -hmm. um, this is something, this is big and important, and he went out and spent a lot of time talking about that stuff. Hmm. Um, as it was, Terry died naturally. Hmm. Um, he didn't get to do the good death that he wanted. Hmm. Um, and I don't know that he ever would, but he wanted the right to have the good death that hmm. he wanted. Um, he wrote before he died what he wanted to go out when he died. What did he say? It, it was just three tweets. Hmm. One about death taking Terry by the hand hmm. and taking him through the doors to the place of, of, of dark sand. Hmm. And then it just said the end. Wow. And there were three tweets from him today mm. um, that he'd written that Rob, his assistant, posted. Mm. And that was where it ended. Well. And I miss my friend. I miss him so much. 
You know, he was... Um... Let me tell you a nice story about Terry. <laughs> because this is, this is how, I want, how I will remember him. Uh, about a year ago, I'm in a car. Somebody else is driving. My phone rings, and I answer it, and a voice says, hello, it's me. I'm doing my memoir. Hmm. I said, really? He says, yeah, I'm doing an autobiography. He says, and there's something I cannot remember, and I thought, maybe you can help me with it. And my heart welled. It's like, Terry, you have Alzheimer's. Of course, I will, I, I will be your memory here. I, nobly <laughs> will be your memory. Mm -hmm. I said, what is it you need to know? He said, well, you remember we were on the Good Omens author tour in February 1990. I said, yeah. And he said, we were in New York and we went to the ABC affiliate radio station. <laughs> <laughs> and there was that, and the interviewer had not actually read the book. He was just trying to interview us. I hadn't even read the press stuff. Mm -hmm. So when we started telling him about Agnes Nutter, who's, he said, the book's called Good Omens, The Nice and Accurate Predictions of Agnes Nutter, who was Agnes Nutter? And we started explaining that there was this 17th century witch who had actually, all of her predictions were true. That her, you know, prediction for 1981 was do not buy Betamax. <laughs> he did not realize this was fictional. <laughs> and we were talking to him, and we realized that he had not read the book. And so we were talking about that. And the engineers in the control room <laughs> behind the glass panel, who we could see because we were facing them and he could not, <laughs> were lying on their backs, kicking their legs. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, of course I remember. I was willing to let that one go on the entire interview. He said, yeah, he said, I had to put him out of his misery. <laughs> he said, but it wasn't that. He said, so, you remember we walked out, we walked out and then we walked down the street and we were singing they might be giant song, shoehorn with teeth. Because it was just so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And we just, and I'm like, I will take your word for it on that <laughs> one. <laughs> he says, was it 40th, 41st or 42nd Street? <laughs> <laughs> At which point I'm going, you have fucking Alzheimer's. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, that, that is how I want to remember Terry. And of course, when we hear the story of how he, he called you that day to ask you about good omens, what, what, what I hear in that story, in addition to everything else that might have been going on, was a, an established novelist had clearly t who met you when you were still writing for what's it what was it uh, space space voyage space i was voyager. 20 what would i have been i would have been 24 mm -hmm. just 24 i mean i know space voyager had those really hot centerfolds but other than Whoa. that not really that well known and <laughs> and clearly had seen something that had been following you and 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 it's not at all to say i mean you had already begun to make a name for yourself in a big way with salmon and Books of Magic, but the number... Actually, wait, actually they hadn't been published. Oh, so... And, um, and the number of writers... I'm writing them, but, but at this point, we're six months away from anything else. Oh, so they have a phenomenon hasn't yeah. even happened yet. Exactly. And, uh, and even so, the number of uh, really wonderful, successful, important comic writers who cross over, if you will, and who, who write fiction, and, and then to become as successful as you, as you have is pretty few. Um, so... You know, this is this was this wonderful thing that he did for you. I'm not saying you wouldn't no. have found your way without him, but clearly he he there was a 
desire on his part to just um, be a mentor in a sense for you, he, right? He, and he was an amazing mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, it was... Um, I remember once we'd done that book, we were at the Seattle World Fantasy Convention mm -hmm. in 1989. We were sharing a room to save money, mm -hmm. which I like, because, you know, by the time, by, you know, a few years later, Terry used to buy hotels before he got there and have them <laughs> refurbished. <laughs> you know, um, and sell them on when he left. Mm -hmm. But back then, we, we were sharing a room to save money, and, and Terry had gone off to bed early, and I did that thing where you creep in, you, 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 you know, open mm -hmm. the door as quietly as you can, your heart, and you take off your shoes mm -hmm. halfway across in the dark without return. And a voice from the darkness says, what time of night do you call this then? Your mother and I have been worried sick. <laughs> 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 And Terry couldn't sleep, and I couldn't sleep, and we sat there, and we plotted Good Omens 2, mm. which we never wrote, oh. but we lay there in the dark in our respective beds. So magical. Just plotting. And it was, it was, I look back on moments like that, and just, just, we're incredibly lucky. My last, the last time I saw Terry, we got to spend some time together, um, and we, when we'd finished spending time together, um, we climbed into a car, and I was handed a script, and Dirk Maggs from the BBC sat in the back seat with a recording unit, and Terry and I recorded our cameo for the Good Omens radio program. Mm that they did on Radio 4. And Terry had lost the ability to read at that point. He couldn't make sense of letters. Mm. Um, so I had to read his lines, and he would repeat them. Mm. And then I'd have to read mine. But because he was never sure which were mine and which were his, <laughs> I would be saying a line, and then he would repeat it. <laughs> and it was, it was a glorious farce mm. of us sitting there with me with the script, and, and uh, but Terry delivered a fantastic performance. Mm. And you can go and listen to it, it's still up online on the BBC, on their Good Omens web pages. And that was the last, the last time we got to spend together, was recording a cameo. Some silly fun. Exactly. And you mentioned, you know, silliness, that British English silliness, you called it, when in Douglas Adams, that sort of that mode of writing and how you realized you could do that. And, um, and that's, there's a, all, depending on the book, there are strong aspects of that in Terry's writing often, too. Um, it's, a, it's a humor that, it's a very knowing kind of humor. It's a humor that depends on the audience's familiarity with all the cliches that have been exhausted so that they can be lampooned. I guess it probably has connection well, to pantomime tradition I, in some I way. Think it, it's, it's, I think it's more interesting than that, um, because it depends... I mean, you're right. It, it, one, it, it can be used a lot to puncture the, the, the things you're familiar with, and now we're supposed to have... Uh, uh, but I think it's much more about narrative voice. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Terry's work, if you look at Douglas Adams, if you look at P.G. Woodhouse, mm -hmm. um, if you look at A.A. Milne's stuff for adults, um, what you get is the voice of the narrator is actually much funnier than any of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, there is a narrative voice where the narrator is looking, knows more than anybody else does, mm -hmm. and is taking you into their confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember Terry once calling me and saying, I'm on novel number, whatever it was, Discworld novel at that point, five or six. He said, and I've just started it with death taking somebody, and I've started most of them like that. He said, I should stop, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And he said, why not? And I said, because at this point, 
It's like a P.G. Woodhouse novel. It's absolutely fine for it to begin with Jeeves coming in <laughs> and seeing Bertie Wooster's new bow tie mm -hmm. or his ukulele mm -hmm. or the moustache that he has just <laughs> proudly grown uh -huh. and disapproving of it. And you know the last thing in the novel mm -hmm. after Jeeves has solved the problem is, is Bertie is going to shave off his moustache. Mm -hmm. Give back the tie, give the tie to Jeeves to destroy, mm -hmm. or the ukulele for him to give to a small child. Mm -hmm. uh, that has to happen, mm -hmm. I said. And, and you don't greet it as, oh God, P.G. Woodhouse is doing that. <laughs> you greet it as, oh good, this mm -hmm. is the familiar strain of a glorious beginning. Mm -hmm. We know where we are, I said. And at this point, you starting a book with death taking somebody is a wonderful way to begin. Mm -hmm.